I'm yeah, I know. Virtual. Yeah, I mean, this is. I mean, <laughs> what you know, do I know? Just, they have to be really careful about this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you don't want to say that that vicious people can't know anything at all. That right, just seems right. obvious. Right. And, and as Calvinists, it's like, dude, then no one knows anything. We're, yeah. <laughs> you know. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase. And this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This episode is a very special episode, as they all are, but this one especially is special. I have with me uh, Dr. Tim Pickavance, and we're going to be talking about epistemology. Surprise, surprise. Some of you may know that he is a co-author of The Atlas of Reality, which is as intense as it sounds, this big, thickle book. But we're not talking metaphysics today. We're talking epistemology. Uh, particularly his new book, Knowledge for the Love of God, which is a great book. And we're going to be talking about that as well as an, a forthcoming paper on effective reason, which is like emotions in epistemology, which is really terrifying for me to think about. So I'm excited to, for him to help me with that. Before we jump in, though, uh, I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for making this podcast happen. If you have benefited from this podcast, if you learn something, if you enjoy it, if you want to see me here bringing scholars to you, uh, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month, as much as $100 a month. If you do for 100 I mean, there's different levels and benefits. But I think you're uh, virtually part of my family. I think that's one of the, the perks there. So check that out. You can find the link in the description wherever you're getting this podcast app. You can also, if you're out here on YouTube, there's a super thanks button down here. If you want to just give a one-time gift uh, to the podcast to the ministry whatever we're calling it nowadays uh that would be huge buy me a cup of coffee whatever and uh another way is to uh buy some merch you can buy some parker's pensies merchandise uh and if you're on youtube you can find that here if you're anywhere else you can find it in the description got all sorts of cool stuff with my dog theophilus on it and uh really cool stuff by chase and han and uh, jordan singer and soon to be more artists too so if you're an artist uh hit me up if you want to draw my stupid face i am all about it all right, that's probably enough uh, for now, but uh, let's pull in uh, Dr. Pickavance and let's get going on epistemology. Dr. Pickavance, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Hey, it's my pleasure, Parker. Glad to be here. Uh, as for those watching, uh, uh, Dr. Pickavance is wearing his headphones like the cool kids, and I really like that about him. Like, <laughs> it's, it's really good. Um, for those listening, sorry, it's an internet joke. You, that's your fault. Um, but uh, Dr. Pickavance, can I... Can I call you Tim? I usually don't ask people on air if I can call them by the name. That'd be great. I'd, your last I'd name's been long, honestly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sweet, Tim. Uh, man, so how did you get into philosophy, and then what made you want to become a professional philosopher? Oh gosh, uh, that's a great question, Parker. Uh, I was an undergraduate at the University of North Texas, which is mm. a big state school in Denton, Texas. It's known most for its jazz program. It has one of the best jazz programs in the world. Huh. Anyway, I, I was an economics student there and I never took a single philosophy class as an undergraduate, um, but I was involved with uh, what used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. Now it's called Crew. Yeah, those and, guys. Yeah, Man. those guys. And if you know anything about Crew folks, um, you do a lot of random evangelism. So you just go out on these college campuses and start talking to people about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it turns out uh, people have questions and you realize you don't know anything and then you probably should figure it out. And so I got it. I got, I, I got into apologetics basically. And I started reading folks like JP Moreland and William Lane Craig. I mean, this is like everybody's story, right? That's right. That this goes, is literally my story. Degree. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's my exact story. Like, it's the least unique story uh, ever. <laughs> so I started reading apologetic stuff and, and kind of fell in love with, uh, the questions and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I just got intrigued by thinking well, and it turned out that a lot of the folks who were writing these great apologetics books um, were involved with the MA program in philosophy at Biola. And so, and they were all in crew uh, too. They were, yeah, that's right. So at that time, I mean, I'm a million years old. So like th this is back when JP and Bill were still like way more involved with crew right. uh, than they are today. And someone told me about the MA Phil program here. I was applying to doctoral programs in economics. 
so I was going to go be a banker or something. I don't know what I was going to do, but yeah. um, I, I was applying to PhD programs in economics to go do econometrics. And I just decided kind of on a whim to apply to the MAPhil at Biola. And I was grateful to get in. And I got on an airplane with a couple suitcases and flew out here and started the program and just really fell in love. I mean, it was a wonderful experience and it worked out. Um, so I, I thought, well, you know, hey, I'll give this a run. And if not, I'll go back to doing, you know, banking finance stuff. And uh, it happened to stick <laughs> for yeah. me, I guess. And so uh, after a couple of years, you know, I, I thought, well, I've got this bug for philosophy. I kind of always had a little bit of a teacher's heart, I suppose. And so it was a natural thing to fit those two things together. And so I went and did a PhD in philosophy at the University of Texas. And um, next thing you know, I'm getting a call back to Biola to teach out here again. So I've been here since 2008, I guess, doing wow. what was, I love. Well, I mean, you, you uh, co-wrote co -wrote this Atlas of Reality. So I'm assuming your dissertation had to be in metaphysics, right? That's right. My dissertation was about the distinction between universals and particulars. So nice. Uh, that was actually a ruse in a way. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't talked about this publicly, but basically I was interested during my time at, at Texas in our cognitive access to reality. So it's always really been about epistemology in a way. And I've yeah. found myself intrigued by the places where there's slippage between uh, the way we represent reality and the way reality is. And so I was going to write a dissertation about mental content Ooh. and it all sort of, um, well, it didn't exactly fall apart. Uh, I talk about this a little bit in the book, but um, it didn't fall apart, but the dissertation I was going to write fell apart. And so I had to restart and it turned out that what I needed to do was deal with some more fundamental issues. Mm. And so the issue that I chose to deal with was this uh, question about the relationship between universals and particulars and what distinguishes those. Um, always with an eye, though, to understanding uh, the nature of concepts and how yeah. concepts that seem universal in a certain sense can give us access to a particular reality. And so I was interested in understanding that, and that required taking this very kind of foundational question which um, wound up in a, you know, uh, I worked with Rob Coons at yeah. Texas and, and then we wound up writing these books together. And, you know, now I, I'm just sort of tired of metaphysics because <laughs> 440,000 words is a lot of words. That's <laughs> so, a big old atlas, man. So it now sounds, I'm just doing epistemology straight up, you know. That's awesome. It sounds, it sounds kind of like uh, you look at the title and you're like, oh, the atlas of reality. Okay, guys, like that's kind of a, a bold statement. Then you look at the book and you're like, oh, my gosh. They actually did it. It's unbelievably yeah. thick. Well, it, it's edited down. I mean, it was yeah. 350,000 words and they nice. said, no, that's too long. You know, yeah. so we, we brought it down to whole 330, you know, that's good. Uh, yeah. Did, did, uh, I mean, you studied with, with JP out there. Did, uh, did he suck you into the phenomenology Dallas Willard type mental concept stuff? I, uh, yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, if you look at JP's work, I, he's a really interesting yeah. dude because I think fundamentally what he's been about, and this is true of Dallas as well, they've been trying to figure out how it is that we can know things about God and the world God made. Yeah. And that requires attention to our nature and it requires attention to the nature of the world. And then it requires understanding how our nature can situate us to understand God in his world. Yeah. And there are different parts of their different programs that allow you to do that. But I think one of the things that is so intriguing about them both is this careful attention to what it is for a person in particular to relate directly with another reality, yeah. whether that's God or the world that God has made. And it, when you take a step back and kind of conceive of their projects in that way, you can really see how the little things that they've been wrestling with are yeah. all connected to trying to understand those things. And I mean, look, I think that a big part of the divergence between philosophers who tend toward a naturalistic vision of reality and 
uh, philosophers who have a more theistic vision of reality concerns the nature of humanity yeah. and how it is that we can have access to the world. And so I, I, in that sense, I think their tradition that they've sort of followed in in this phenomenological thing is, is one way of trying to unpack and appreciate how all that's supposed to work. And if you think about Dallas, he was moving from that into the more epistemic spaces. JP was trying to understand something like the metaphysical foundations of how we mm. get that kind of epistemology. And both of those are extraordinarily valuable. And I, I think even though I wouldn't describe myself as a phenomenologist mm -hmm. in any meaningful sense, um, I still think I've been heavily influenced by the work that they've done. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Uh, and I, I get that from, from Brandon all the time too. And then, you know, cause I have Paul too. And like we had JP for philosophy of science. So like yeah. it's, it's in there deep. It's, it's fun. I have a, a yeah. I feel like a kindred spirit there. Um, but so I, I wanted to get into this paper on, so I, I do want to talk about knowledge for the love of God, uh, but I thought maybe we could just go general epistemology first and talk about this new paper you have coming out uh, with Jason McMartin, uh, Effective Reason. Yeah. And man, just real quick, like what the heck are we talking about? What is Effective Reason? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. Um, I wish I knew. Part no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there has been a huge explosion of literature about the role of emotion. Usually it starts with emotion, but in general, the affective domain mm -hmm. in understanding the world. So what's the relationship between our affect and our knowledge? And we have the title affective reason because um, David Sosa, who was one of my profs at the University of Texas, he said that every good title has a double meaning. Huh. And so I've taken that to heart. And affective reason is supposed to be a play on the affect effect thing. Okay. So it's only going to be effective insofar as it has the relevant sorts of affective stuff with uh. it. But it's about reason with affect, right? Yeah. So uh, that's the that's the sort of play on words there. It's not very nice. good, but you know, there I it is like, anyway. I can get it. Yeah, it yeah. helps me write papers, you know. Yeah. So uh, when I when we talk about affective reason, um, and J Jason, just to mention, is a theologian here at Biola who actually did the MA philosophy also, but he's hmm. gone the, the route of, of theology, and he's a he's a good friend of mine. We've been working on this project for some time. And affective reason, we're, we're thinking of it basically as the the way that our affective states play a role in our rationality, yeah. primarily. Obviously with an eye toward knowledge questions, but we're concerned usually with some kind of understanding of rationality specifically. Yeah. And, um, and so in the paper, we're trying to articulate a, a way of understanding that, that we think is actually quite old, but that has gone underexplored in this contemporary explosion of literature on emotions and other affective states that's happened in the last 20 years, uh, driven in part by people like uh, Bob Roberts and yeah. others who have thought of emotions as playing a very vital role in our understanding of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what a, a fantastic name. Uh, uh, Bob Roberts, but uh, yeah, that, that yeah. name comes up a lot. So I, I think uh, it's cool that that uh, it's cool that Jason is a theologian because it's this has like kind of a theologiany type feel to it. Like it's like a maybe like a retrieval theology, right? Or it's 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 pulling that back. And then you got the the philosophical chops as well. Uh, uh, he does too because he did the masters there. But it's a really cool project. I think I think uh, when initially when people think about emotions or uh, emotions and knowledge, they usually think of it in a negative way. That like you're mm -hmm your emotions have negatively shaped your, um, uh, your knowledge or, or kept you from knowledge or something like that. Is that, I don't know the state of play right now. Like uh, have you have uh, epistemologists have to like overcome that kind of bias that emotions are a bad thing and we should be all Spock. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, there has been a little bit of that. Um, I, I actually think, I, okay. So if you go read in the literature on emotions, most papers about the epistemology of emotions start like this. The first stage is, look, we don't really know what emotions are, but we think we have a pretty good idea of how to name some of them. And then the second part is, 
everybody's for a really long time said emotions are really bad for understanding or yeah. for rationality. So those are like, those are two tropes that you okay. find basically in every, every paper. I mean, even our paper starts with like, what is an emotion? Ah, you know, whatever. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter. You know it when you see it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but the, the, the trope that emotions only play a negative role is I think actually historically overblown. Okay. Um, it's, it was, it kind of became a thing through the enlightenment period. Uh -huh. um, but even there, it's much more complex uh, than you might imagine it to be. Uh, so a lot of people think of Descartes as like the, I mean, that's pre-enlightenment, right? But a lot of people think of Descartes as the person who started this thing where we, yeah. you know, took it all, out he, of Yeah, he ruined mind. everything. We're brains on sticks. I love Descartes. Yeah. So I, don't, you know, I think no, I mean, he gets I, a bad rap. Right. I think yeah. he made some mistakes, but he, sure. he has these treatises on the nature of affect and so on. So anyway, it's a little overblown. Yeah. But there still is the sense that we all appreciate that emotions sometimes do lead us astray. Sure. And so um, the interesting thing about the contemporary landscape is that there have been a lot of, of thinkers, both in psychology and in philosophy and theology, for that matter, who mm -hmm. are trying to recover an older understanding according to which emotions when and other affective states when oriented properly can be not just not bad yeah but could actually be a boost and maybe crucial for our understanding so this is people like bob roberts right so one of the one of the views that we we sort of describe but aren't defending is this view that emotions function as evidence yeah. that emotions are literally just evidence for especially things in the normative realm so and that that's great too. Effective, uh, there's great grade one is that like emotions uh, position us evidentially. Grade yes. two is emotions are actually evidence themselves. That's right. So that's how we describe it. We, I mean, that's like that's the way that we are talking, right? Oh, nice. Uh, so I'm just going to put that forward as if that's what. Yeah, everyone... yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, the one view is that emotions are actually functioning as evidence. So so Bob thinks that emotions are basically. Uh, construals of aspects aspects of the world that are based on your concerns. So he calls yeah. them concern-based construals. So he basically think of, thinks of them as sort of like ways of seeing. Uh, that's that's more metaphorical than Bob would want, but they're they're kind of like uh, you know the Rorschach kind of locks in in a certain way, and you you have access to certain normative parts of the world that without that emotion you wouldn't have access to. So they're kind of they're ways of seeing as basically. Yeah. And and so in that sense, they would be evidence in the same way that sort of perceptual states are evidence for the external world. Emotions are going to be evidence with respect to things like normative claims, like what's good and bad or right and wrong and, yeah. um, you know, helpful, unhelpful even. Well, so what do you make of that? I mean, do you do you come down on that what, one way or the other? Do you think Bob's right on that? Yeah, uh, I have mixed <laughs> feelings. So. I really want it to be true, uh -huh. <laughs> but there's this book by uh, an emotions philosopher uh, named Michael Brady called okay. Emotional Insight. And he, the book is basically a, uh, an assault on the perceptual theory of emotions. And okay. he points out some very difficult troubles uh, for this view. And I frankly don't know what I think about it. Yeah. So here's one, just to give you a sense. Our perceptual states are evidence about the external world. Let's just grant that for a minute. Okay. okay? Yeah. Now, if you get different forms of evidence for the same judgment, right? Suppose you judge that something had a particular color or whatever yeah. through your perceptual state. And then someone testified to you about the same thing and really any other kind of evidence you can imagine that would give you insight. So you did some spectral analysis or whatever, and you discovered that it, you know, I don't know. I don't know what scientists <laughs> do, whatever. It doesn't yeah, matter. Right. right. So you get all this other evidence. That evidence sort of piles on itself. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So it's not like, it's not like there's any screening off that happens. Okay. Okay. So Brady points out that with emotions, it's a little bit different. Hmm. That actually, uh, you know, if, if you think that emotions might signal for you that you're in danger, 
you might have the feeling and it signals for you that you're in danger. But then once you've identified the attributes in the world, the things in the world and their features that are actually the things that are a danger to you, the emotions role in the confidence you have actually gets screened off. Yeah, it did its job. It alerted you. It did you its to, job, but yeah. what it what it's supposed to do is get your attention fixed in certain ways so that then you can actually evaluate the world, say, perceptually. Right? Yeah, that's now, like the like Spider-Man Spidey sense. Like it's not you don't stop with the Spidey sense, you're supposed to look around to see. That's right. And yeah. and then the Spidey sense sort of lose it stops being relevant. Right. right? right now this right. is very much unlike perceptual states. So that argument is slippery in certain ways. And there are responses to it. I think, I, you know, sure. honestly, it's been a while since I've thought that carefully about it. So I don't yeah. have all of those, you know, locked and loaded for you today. But, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that, that argument, it's a kind of bootstrapping problem of sorts, like, and, and I, I just think, um, wow, that's a troubling thing. If you think that emotions are something like perceptual states, right? Yeah. So, I've been wanting to return to that. I've been working on these other things, right? So I haven't gotten back to it, but that's the sort of thing that gives me pause to just embrace the ideas that uh, that, that Bob Roberts has put forward, which I really, really like actually. Yeah. The good news for Jason and I is that that very well may be true and it doesn't disrupt the the paper that we're trying to write at all. Right, because you go on to this, like, this third grade uh, yeah. effective reason, which is that effective states are appraisers of evidence. Can you yes. help us with that one? Yeah, okay. Um, I think it helps to take a step back, Yeah. right? And so this might take a little while to unpack. So forgive me and feel free to- No, let's do it, man. Want to. Yeah. So um, in, the, in the, the literature on rationality of late, so forget, it, forget emotions and affective states for a minute. Okay. There's all this conversation about disagreement and, and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And what's emerged in those conversations is a picture of rationality that is somewhat surprising. So we tend to think of rationality, especially if you're a kind of evidentialist, which I basically am. Um, if you're an evidentialist, you think something like this. Well, look, all that's relevant to what I judge to be true, what I believe, my credence, whatever you want to call it, right? What, pick your favorite dogmatic state, right? Yeah. I don't care. We can do it tri tripartite. We can do it with credences. Doesn't matter. Okay. All that's relevant to where you ought to land, right? Whatever credence you're supposed to be in, or which mushy credence, or which you know, uh, you know, belief, disbelief, or you know, neutrality, or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. All that's relevant is evidence, right? Yeah. And the the problem is that it looks like sometimes people can share evidence and have different judgments, and both of them be rational. And that seems kind of weird if you're an evidentialist. Because so of hot. like uniqueness, right? Because, or, yes. or if you hold to it, uniqueness, I guess, right? Yeah, if you hold the uniqueness. Now, it is possible to be an evidentialist without being a uniqueness person. And I mean, if you have this sort of like crude view of evidentialism where it's just the evidence and the, the judgment. Yeah. Um, but there is some pressure, right? And the pressure is something like this. Evidence is truth indicating, like it's meant to indicate the truth. So take two people who you think are reasonably disagreeing about whether God exists. Yeah. who have gone through all the evidence together. They've read the same books and so on roughly. I mean, you, know, you have to patch all this stuff up, but yeah. you get the idea. And one of them still believes that God exists and the other one still believes that God doesn't exist, say. And you want to say, well, if the evidence, and, and you want to also say they're both rational. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's, that's big, right? So if yeah. you think that kind of case is possible, then if evidence is truth indicating, it's hard to see how you could put all these pieces together because you want to say something like, well, look, the evidence points toward God's existence, but also points toward God's non-existence. Yeah. But if evidence is truth indicating, really, doesn't that just mean that the evidence points toward neutrality? Yeah. Right? How could it do both of those things without something else in the mix or if it really is just a truth indicator? Yeah. Now, um, something I've thought about thinking about but haven't thought about <laughs> is that maybe evidence does more than indicate truth. Um, huh. I don't, you know. This is not in the paper nor in the book. So yeah. I, this is just this is just between me and you, Parker. Okay. Yeah, it's good. This doesn't go up on the internet or anything. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. This is just between us. Yeah. That's right. Um, no, I've I've thought about thinking about whether evidence might also be the sort of thing that tethers our judgments and causes them to persist. So if you look at Plato, he says something like 
true opinions become knowledge when they're tied down with an account of the reason why. Yeah. So you might think the reason why is important there, but also the tethering. So it got so maybe evidence provides a kind of intellectual stability also. Anyway, okay. okay. I don't want to get into that. That's as far as I can yeah. go. Um, I find that thought fascinating. Okay, so yeah. back to this idea about evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, people have looked at this. So people like Miriam Schoenfield and others. Um, she's one of my favorites, so I always think of her first. Yeah. Uh, and and Schoenfield will say something like this. Well, maybe there's something more going on, right? Maybe it's not just evidence. It's also what she will call your rational standards. Okay. And so you might think um, lots of our theoretical judgments are formed on the basis of things like abductive inferences, right? They're inferences to the best explanation. Yeah. And inferences to the best explanation involve taking some evidence and coming to a judgment using these kind of principles, like it needs to be explanatorily powerful, it needs to be simple, it needs to be conservative, that is, it needs to sort of preserve the evidence, right? Yeah. And all of that kind of stuff. But those things sometimes trade off of one another, they play off of one another, they're kind of intention, right? They're not in conflict, but they're intention, because a simple theory might not be as explanatorily powerful. Right. right, so it depends on which one you're valuing more. If someone really likes simplicity, Swinburne or someone, and someone else That's really likes explanatory power, you're going to have different degrees. Yes. That's exactly right. So now notice that if you weight those things differently, mm -hmm. you might have the same evidence, but come to a different judgment. Yeah. Right. So yeah. there are these views that have emerged according to which there's evidence and evidence is doing the real work, but the evidence has to be reflected sort of through this other thing. Yeah. For Schoenfield, it's something like rational standards. And then you have a very different view, but has a similar structure, all of these pragmatic encroachment people or moral encroachment people. Yeah. The encroachment folks think that it's something else that kind of balances or, or reads or, uh, you know, I don't know, stands between evidence and judgment somehow, where the evidence that you have has to get sort of read through these yeah. other things. Right. Yeah. So what's at stake for you makes a difference to what you should believe. That's the pragmatic encroachment. Yeah. OK, so on our view, we're thinking maybe emotions go in that spot. Yeah. So maybe emotions are something or other affective states are something that helps you appreciate or uh, or gives you a way of bridging between the evidence and a judgment and something like the way that rational standards or I don't know, uh, pragmatic stuff or whatever do. And here's, here's like the first thing that I, I want to just say by way of like, this isn't totally insane. Okay, <laughs> so if you look at the people who have written about uh, abductive inference, there aren't, there aren't that many people as it turns out, it's kind of hard to say much about it. But the yeah. people that have, they often talk about balancing these different principles, simplicity, explanatory power and so on, in terms of aesthetics, they think of it as a kind of aesthetic thing, yeah. right? So you'll find people talking about the beauty of a theory and so on, right? And they always and just point to the mathematicians and they go, well, look, the mathematicians talk about it and they're yeah. hardcore, like they're as good. So if they can yeah. do it, we can do that too. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And so, yeah. but, but here's, here's, but okay. So they talk about that sort of stuff, but notice that in the literature on affective states, one of the main things that the affective domain is supposed to give us access to are things like aesthetics, morality, yeah. and those kinds of judgments, right? So the aesthetic domain is connected up to the affective. So if you think that there's something like this rational standards form of evidentialism going on, like Schoenfield's, you might think that the way you balance those judgments, or I'm sorry, the way you balance those different uh, principles, like be as explanatorily powerful as possible, all things equal, right, et cetera. Yeah. That's a kind of, if that's an aesthetic thing, it looks like it might be carried through the affective. Yeah. Right? Um, so, yeah, there are other people besides Schoenfeld, by the way. So uh, Tom Kelly has an, is another person who says this sort of thing. Yeah. He talks about it in terms of balancing the Jamesian goals between believing truths and avoiding falsehoods, right? So there, there are lots of these different views around but all of them share this one picture, right? So you've got your evidence, 
you've got something like standards or some other thing, that, and then you've got the judgment. So yeah. you've got a non-binary, it's a three-part evidentialist relation. And then the third thing is rational standards, pragmatic stuff, or we think maybe the affective stuff. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, uh, I don't know, being in like a submarine and you got, you got uh, a wall of all these knobs and each knob is a different like explanatory virtue that you get simplicity. And and so different people are going to twist those knobs differently. You could think of like, uh, uh, the the thing on your wall, the the temperature, uh, temperature thing that that in your house, the, uh, no, what's it, what's it called? What's on the wall, man, I just blew this. Oh, your thermostat thermostat there we go thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. everyone's gonna want it at a different temperature and so people are jiggering with it all the time um i wonder so i i'm, I'm back to like the nervousness about emotions where I, i'm wondering like are there are there objective norms for the emotions as well for the you know effective reason otherwise you know this guy feels this way and so he's gonna weight the explanatory virtues in this way and then we're left in like i don't want to say skept- uh, uh, uh relativism or or subjectivism because that's so played out but you see like the worry when you let emotions in are there objective norms where everyone should feel this way about explanatory power and simplicity and they all there's an objective way that the dial should be turned i mean that's a great question so um it, it turns out that in in schoenfield's great paper it's called permission to believe when she's talking about this someone pushes on she she imagines someone pushing on her view right and saying something like well you say that people with different rational standards can have different judgments with the same evidence and both be yeah. rational yeah but what about the standards like doesn't that just push the question back right yeah. and her response is not deeply satisfying <laughs> but is maybe right and the response is something like well everybody has that problem i mean so so imagine you think that there's only one way to be yeah you're not going to be able to justify or or well, yeah, just I'll just say justify. You're not going to be able to justify that independent of the standards you inhabit, right? So there's there's there comes a moment when you have to say, well, look, we're making these judgments from within our perspective. Now you're worried about some kind of skeptical problem here, and I mean. I don't know a theory of knowledge on which skepticism isn't a threat. The proper functionalists always go, no, we're good. You know, we well, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, if you read Planinga, for example, he's like, even God can't justify the claim that he's functioning properly. Yeah. So now I grant that you don't have to know that you're properly functioning in order to know things on that view, nor to even know that you know things. But there is something sort of dissatisfying about that response, and it shares the same structure. Yeah. So okay. So that's so now here's what I want to say though. Um, I think our affective lives may be subject to a related but not identical species of rationality related to but not identical related to epistemic forms of rationality but not identical to epistemic rationality because i think the rationality fundamentally is about a kind of fittingness oh i'm so So, glad i was going to ask you about rationality because some of my epistemologist friends go you know we don't even i don't even like saying uh, rationality because it's all these different uh uses of it or because it's such a low bar that being rational is not that big a deal but it seems like you're playing on rationality It, it it does do more than that well okay so i think there's there's a there's a ton to say about this okay but rationality fundamentally is about fitting right it's about fitting yourself in certain ways according to certain principles now so that's why we can talk about you know strategic rationality say or we can talk about you know um uh the rationality uh that attends to decision making or the rationality that attends to the mind or you know and i think our affective states are similarly structured yeah um i don't think our i I mean i think we just find ourselves with affective states but that doesn't mean that they're all apt right yeah yeah, yeah, right any parent any parent (laughs) will tell you that part of parenting is helping your children understand why they're having the emotional reactions that they are yeah 
and then kind of taking a step back from them and evaluating whether or not they're fitting with reality. And over time, that can shape the way you feel in response to certain things. So this yeah. is part of why we care about things like virtue, right? right. Virtue right. involves feeling certain things, at least in some cases of virtue, they involves feeling certain things in the right circumstances. So you might think that that's, that kind of rationality is not the same as epistemic rationality because it's not really about responding to evidence in the right ways, uh -huh. but it's, it's sort of connected because there are features of the world that give rise to certain feelings or other affective states. And then those feelings can be evaluated for aptness. Mm -hmm. But notice that it's, you're kind of going to dance in a little circle if you try to use that then to justify your picture of like how you want to be effectively to get knowledge of God, say, yeah. right? You're, because you're going to have to like be deploying your judgment that God exists in order to say, this is the right experience to have in relationship to this aspect of the world. So yeah. there's, it's not exactly like not a problem anymore. That's a double negative, sorry. But yeah. it maybe like expands the circle a little bit more than what Schoenfield can do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, I, whether, that's, I, whether that's satisfying at the end of the day, I don't know. Uh, you know, we honestly, so Parker, the, the thing to realize about this paper is we basically think this is a view that's worth a lot of people thinking really hard about. Yeah. We don't, we're not defending the claim that it's true. Right. Uh, right. Both of us think, man, something like this seems kind of right. And yeah. we have some arguments, but what we really want is the community of philosophers to give this a run. Right. And and so we're trying to just like kick that off because no one's been talking about it, despite yeah. the fact that it looks like a historically prominent position. Well, and so you're you've brought it to my t attention as well, where like there is this thing shaping our weight of different explanatory virtues. And I, I love that. I think that's so cool because so often we just think, oh, we all have the exact same standards uh and therefore they're all gonna be weighted the same and so here we go you're just stupid if you don't see things my way and it's like well maybe you have maybe you're emotionally stupid now we can add that in there or something but um i'm just kidding about that but i mean yeah there's, there's i mean a, look i'm emotionally reason. stupid sometimes yeah so. that's right but it's it's like another it's another error theory so i don't have to be a jerk by saying that me and this guy aren't epistemic peers we're not epistemic peers possibly if we're not and we still disagree with each, each other it's, it could be because of the weight of the explanatory virtues are, are, are different weights that we have on them. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, think about it this way. Um, this is one of the ways, I, we, honestly, Jason and I have been struggling to figure out a way to describe this because a lot of people have the reaction you had, Parker, which is like, yeah. whoa, what, like what's up with this, right? Yeah. So um, here's a striking thing. And this is in part kind of the, the, the sort of, I don't know, Presbyterian elder in me. Um, uh, so... I have concerns for people to experience the world as Jesus would have us experience it, right? And I'm a philosopher. Like when I'm in, when I'm doing philosophy, I do philosophy, right? But yeah, you bracket off your face. Day, and... Yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. But uh, but I mean, I do have these these concerns that are bigger than just the philosophical community, you know. Right. right. And one of my concerns is with understanding why it is that people wrestle with jesus right mm. and even including myself right this is within the church and without yeah and there's this interesting tradition in the in the sort of conversations about things like worldviews and so on yep there's this idea that a worldview functions as a kind of story mm. right meta and stories yeah. yeah well but stories I, I like the idea of a story yeah it's a meta narrative it's a story and I like the idea of a story because stories are more than just a list of historical facts. If you think yeah. of the story as a kind of history, yes. it's more than that. Like I love Harry Potter, for example. Uh -huh. And if you're reading Harry Potter, sort of longing for Voldemort to win, you it's not that you're just like weird. It's that you haven't understood the story. So to really yeah. in, inhabit the story, you're meant to feel certain things, to hope for certain things, to yeah. want certain things, to be afraid of certain things the emotional weight of the story is part of the story. It's part yeah. of comprehending the story. Now, those things are often unstated though, right? Nowhere in the story does it say, root for Voldemort to lose now, <laughs> right. or feel this way about the struggles that Harry's having or whatever, right? It just sort of happens to you. Yeah. 
Now, if we take the idea that everyone inhabits some kind of worldview or other seriously, and we take seriously the idea that they function as a story, what we're basically saying is something like that emotional valence of storytelling really matters. Yes. Yeah. It matters for understanding how to take this thing that just occurred in the world and understand its import. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I think a good case in point is stuff about suffering. Right. Yeah. So if you're, if you're suffering, you know, there are all these things that the Bible says about suffering. Like they all, everything works together for the good of those, but you know, all these things that are really hard for people to believe and me, me to believe too. Mm -hmm. But part of, what it means to sort of embrace those truths is to have the kind of emotional situatedness that is the embrace of the story kind of like emotionally, affectively embracing the story that allows you to situate that experience of suffering in the bigger picture of the world that's painted in the whatever worldview you inhabit, Yeah. right? And so that's gonna shape whether you think this bit of evil functions as evidence against the existence of God, well, that's going to turn on questions of whether God had a reason to allow that evil and whether you would know what it is if he did, right? All this sort of problem of evil stuff, right? Yep. But a lot of that is going to be carried through the kind of affective stuff that goes along with inhabiting a worldview. So yeah. that's the that's the kind of thing that we have in mind. So there are all these kind of like hints at this that are all over the place. And what we're trying to do is like make that philosophically explicit. Yeah, you you like blew up my mind because uh, it's so you touched on so many exciting things that I've been thinking about. Um, so I, I I worked with uh, Kevin. My my audience can be so sick of this, but my I worked with Kevin Van Hooser uh, for my master's thesis, and he always talks about a theodrama, and he uses this authorial analogy for the God world relation. And I I've come to actually think we genuinely live in like a story, uh, and yeah. and it ties together a lot of Christian theology, God's relation to the world. God and time, but also like theodicy type stuff. And mm -hmm. it, it helps motivate skeptical theism. Like I'm a character narratively situated. I, I, I would have to know the whole story in order to know whether or not this is gratuitous or whether or not there's a greater good or a subsequent good or antecedent good. So I love that, man. It's so exciting. Um, the story motif is just so awesome. And even thinking of worldview that way, I, I've been thinking I've been trying to conceptualize it, like the difference between theology and philosophy for a while. And I yeah. think that this might be a terrible uh, conceptualization, but it seems like philosophy studies, like the, the furniture of the story. Like, you know, you look yeah. in Harry Potter and you're like, well, what's like, what is this magic? Like, what is that able to do? What does that spell do? Let's look at that. But like theology looks at like the story of like Harry and like the, the grander story going on. Um, that might be really terrible, but I, I just thought of it this morning. So give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, man, I, this love is, that. I mean, I, I think that's interesting. I, I you know, it, those things are difficult to pin down. Right. And, super and then I, I, one of the things I like about that way of thinking about it is there's a, there's obviously a spectrum there. Yeah. And so there are going to be spaces where it's sort of like asking the question, is this philosophy or theology isn't going to make a lot of sense. It's going to be, is, is this more philosophical than theological right. or less? Right? right. And that's, right. I think a healthier spot to be in. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, so you, you got me all amped up with all this stuff. Did, are you are you a Presbyterian elder? Is that is that for real? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I I'm a I have been a part of the Presbyterian Church in America since that's like 2003 when I started my PhD at the University of Texas. Wow. And um, I've been at the church where I attend now for 13 years, I guess. Actually, 13 years next month. Wow. Um, and I've I've been an elder for a, for a minute now, and I'm also a scholar in residence at my church. So nice, anyway, dude. I, I love PCA, the church, right? basically. The P yeah, P PCA. PCA. Okay, nice. Yeah, PCA. Dude, that, and my that church is called called Redeemer. Redeemer. Yeah, it's great. They're all called Redeemer. Yeah, they're all called Redeemer. Both the churches, both the Presbyterian churches I've been a part of, have been called Redeemer. Always. Presbyterians Redeemer. aren't uh, particularly <laughs> creative. Yeah, <laughs> when it comes right. to right. churches. So well, I just I are you uh, are you compatibilist by chance? Oh, Parker. Sorry, we're, we're, Do we we're have to talk here, about man. this? No, okay. Um, I have complicated views. The other so, elders are going to be hearing this. They're going to be upset. No, no, no. Man. It's fine. Um, I think that my views are very much compatible with the Westminster Confession of Faith. All right. Okay. So, um, but I don't think that Westminster is fundamentally a compatibilist document in the modern sense of compatibilism. Okay. So I think we have to be really careful when we think about compatibilism and incompatibilism because we have to articulate 
what kind of cause. And so the, the confession, the Westminster Confession is very clear on the distinction between primary and secondary causes. Uh -huh. And I know that some people like say this and then they're like, so I don't have to think about this anymore. That's but right. <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't have that view. I just am like, look, I don't know how God's providence works. Uh, you know, I don't know. But what I do know <laughs> is that it, it's not, it doesn't function fundamentally by way of efficient cause. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so I think that the primary problems that philosophers have been wrestling with in that literature, and I'm not an expert, so this is me as a kind of like onlooker, yeah, not as a sort of baked in the, you know, midst of it thing. I think that fundamentally what philosophers are concerned with, the kind of compatibilism that seems so disruptive to the sort of freedom that's morally relevant okay. is efficient causal forms of determinism. So yeah. it's where we have sort of billiard ball style. Yeah, or hand in the puppet. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff strikes me as uh, problematic. For sure. And I mean, there, there are folks in my denomination who have views that I find deeply troubling along these lines, right? But we have disagreements about that. That's fine. I'm yeah. cool with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm, I would describe my views of Providence more as roughly Thomistic. Okay. Um, and and the, the what I mean by that is just I yeah, don't think of God's yeah I don't think of God's primary mode of operation as efficient cause for sure. And the reason I don't think that are the reasons that people like Hugh McCann have articulated. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so that book really helped me. Um, he basically makes the case that you can't think of God's primary modes of operation as efficient causal. That's not to say God can't do efficient causal stuff in the world. Right. But generally speaking, his general providence is not that way. Yeah. And so I tend to be a libertarian, but I'm, um, I, I also think that our salvific choices are only possible by special divine grace. Interesting. And so in that sense, it's it's not like um, it's not like I'm not I'm not a Wesleyan in that sense. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's better to describe me as a kind of Calvinist, but who has a general view of providence that's more like a Thomist. Yeah. If, if that uh, makes sense. Yeah. So uh, Hugh McCann's book, Creation and the Sovereignty of God. Uh, that's the one. He, he brings up the authorial analogy and I love that. And then he goes in and says, well, maybe we can solve libertarian free will. And I, I closed the book there, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, that, that's awesome, man. I, I love it. Sorry. I didn't mean to, to grill you there. No, no, no. Um, By the way, just real quick on that. As McCann points out, the Thomistic view doesn't make evil easier. It actually makes it harder. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's just, not, it's not better. You lose the free will defense and, and yeah. that's really bad. Um, yeah, so yeah, anyway, yeah. I just want to put yeah. that on the table. Like, I don't think this solves the problem of evil. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm with you. There's this is a whole we I, I may have uh <laughs> brought us down a rabbit trail. We could we could <laughs> talk about that forever. Um I wanna jump back on to um evidentialism a little bit and, and sure. I man, just by default, I, I studied theology and everyone over there, you have to be a proper functionalist. And so and once I jumped over into philosophy, I was like, Well, I don't know if I want to be an externalist because I think if Neo woke up out of the matrix, like he wouldn't be justified in his beliefs. And the, the externalists are like, well, it just depends if he's in the good case. And it's like, well, how does he, he doesn't know that he's in the good case. And the, so yeah. I think I became more, uh, I'm slipping more into evidentialism and internalism, but um, I, I don't know what evidence is, what counts as evidence. And now I'm realizing that there's a debate on that. Like are, what is evidence or are seemings evidence? Can, what, what do you think? Oh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that question is really hard. Okay. That's what I think. That's good. Um, I'm in good company then. I don't have well worked out views about this. Okay. I tend to think, okay, so are we, you want to be real for a hot second? Let's do it. Um, Let's do it. I'm going to get myself in all sorts of trouble. Um, <laughs> I think that evidence okay let me take a step back yeah the whole conversation between internalists and externalists is often used as a proxy for conversations between evidentialists and non-evidentialists about whatever it is that makes the difference between 
right. true belief and knowledge. Uh -huh. I think that's a mistake. Okay. And the reason I think it's a mistake is because I think what evidence we have might have externalist individuation conditions, maybe. Uh, okay. So, and that's because it's, it might be that it's your acquaintance with an external object that is your evidence. Not the seeming, the acquaintance. The acquaintance. Wait, I'm, not, I'm not committing to this. I'm just sort of pointing yeah. it out as a possibility, right? So suppose you think that might be right, like that your evidence about, like you might be a direct realist, right? This is what direct realists think about sure. perception. They think sure. you just like are acquainted with the external object. Now, there are seemings going on, but that's not your evidence. Your evidence might be the thing itself. That, that right? causes it the seemings? Actions. Yeah, it would cause the seemings, but the evidence is the thing. Is the not, evidence is... Is E equal K? Is evidence knowledge then? Or? Okay. I, mm, okay. <laughs> so I haven't said anything about that. <laughs> Let me finish. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if you think that, then you might have different evidence, but from the inside, not be able to tell. Okay. Now that is a, so you are right in noticing that what I'm describing is something in the neighborhood of Tim Williamson's view yeah. about evidence. I, I, you know, Williamson is a slippery picture of knowledge and i don't know but yeah. i will say that i think that acquaintance is basically at the bottom of epistemology in the sense okay. that it's what we're acquainted with that is the basic structure of what gives rise to the rest of our knowledge so if you think about knowledge as a kind of foundationalist would you've got these sort of basic bits of knowledge and then from there, you sort of build a superstructure where you're drawing inferences or doing whatever it is that human beings can do. And it's it's complicated, right? And I don't sure, want to get sure. into all the complexities, sure. but fundamentally, I think at that basic level, a lot of what's going on down there is that we're acquainted with things in the world. Can you be acquainted with uh, abstracta? I think so. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I like it then. So, you know, I love math. Uh, yeah. math is great. So, yeah. yeah. And I mean, look, I, so if, if that's right and I'm, you know, then it seems at least possible that you might have two people with different evidence who, if you just think about their phenomenal seemings, uh -huh. everything's the same. Yeah. Now this is what the, I mean, so phenomenology, just to go back to people like JP and Dallas, phenomenology is the attempt to really discern whether that's even possible, right? And the, the general instinct of the phenomenologist is to think that whenever people are acquainted with different things, at the end of the day, that will manifest in experience somehow or other, right? Yeah, but you might have yeah, to, right, right. yeah, but you might have to train yourself to be able to have those experiences. Now, suppose that's right. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to suggest that it's possible for people to not be equipped to notice differences that may be there in experience, but aren't noticed. Just like, now, like drinking wine. Like I mean, if I, if, yes. if I drink wine, I'm not going to notice all the notes and the earthy afterbirth and all that stuff like the wine yeah. taster will. Now. Okay. So here's where it gets tricky, right? Uh -huh. So does that mean that you're already experiencing those things, but just can't, yeah, I know. Notice the things in your experience, or does that mean that your experience is fundamentally different mm -hmm. than the Solomon? Yeah. Sommelier. I always sommelier. say I was, I was, I was going to say it, but I didn't. Yeah. Sommelier. Sommelier. sommelier? So, I don't know. Whatever. Don't it doesn't know. matter. Yeah. Uh, sommelier. Like, yeah. I said experience... Pensies instead of Ponce, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is your experience the same, but you're noticing different things about it, or is your experience actually different? So yeah. what I'm suggesting is that it might be possible for you to be experiencing something different, even though from an acquaintance standpoint, you're acquainted with the same thing. And so it, you know, the training is actually noticing things about things you're acquainted with, but it, that those things aren't showing up in your experience as it were. Yeah. Does this make yeah. sense? So it these, does these make are, sense. But this is like, this is real deep. It's right? rock bottom stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that deep stuff, I mean, that's where philosophy gets fun, but it's also yeah. where it gets really hard. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I Start don't saying know crazy what stuff. to say about that. Yeah. Well, and I, I just wonder real quick on that, like, just, I hope that doesn't like preclude the possibility of uh, inverted qualia. Cause I really like that argument against, you know, like phys physicalisms and stuff. Yeah. I mean, so, like, I don't know. Maybe. 
Uh, I hope not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, don't do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks for letting me just drag you in deep <laughs> and get you in trouble, not only with your elders, but with the rest of the philosophical <laughs> community as well. Uh, no, look, but, when I was becoming an elder, I had to write like a commentary on Westminster on the confession. And I, I know like that stuff's tough. I had like, I had like 23 things that I was worried about, you know, nice. and it was all fine. You know, no do, you take, it's do, you take, do you have to take exemptions as an elder? Do you have to, or are you able to? So, do that? so you can't take, so there, there's like this distinction between differences and exceptions, Okay. you know, and exceptions are differences that strike at the vitals. You know, I don't know what, I mean, that's yeah, the way we talk about this stuff. So basically yeah. I have differences, but no, I don't take any exceptions. You're not really wow. allowed to take an exception and be an elder. Exceptions gotcha. would be things like, yeah, I don't know if God's triune. Like that would oh. be an exception. And then they're oh. like, no, you probably shouldn't be an elder in this church. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, but okay. if you just have differences, like here's an example. One of the last things about Westminster is this stuff about having the same body when you're resurrected. Yeah. And I'm like, either that is trivially true or it's false. And it's trivially true if you're a Thomist about embodiment, basically. Like if you think that the identity of a body yeah. is a function of the identity of the soul that inhabits it, um, which is kind of my view. Or you think it's the same stuff. And I don't think it's the same stuff it's not necessarily. The same stuff. Sorry, physical. But I think that the, so then this, what is the content of the claim that is, so I just like, I was like, I don't really know what this means, but either way I can make sense of it. I disagree. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, and they were like, that's fine. No one was even thinking about that. Uh, okay. You know, why did you even point that out? So yeah. you're yeah. a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's what you get. Well, yeah, exactly. So, so with this uh, effective reason, with the the third grade, uh, effective states are appraisers of evidence. Sorry to mm -hmm. get here's some whiplash for you, but yeah. um, you you mentioned this in the paper that someone might bring up, like, how is this different than virtue epistemology, yeah. um, and and then also like standpoint epistemology, and that's the big boogeyman today. So, like, yeah. if if this is standpoint, then oh no, you're an, you're a postmodernist, uh, you know, wokey person. Can you help us out? Like, what, how how does this compare and differ mm -hmm. from those two? Yeah. Okay. Great. That's great. Um, virtue epistemology. The, the reason why Jason and I have come to the view that this doesn't count as virtue epistemology, even though it's kind of in the neighborhood, is that virtue epistemology makes knowledge dependent on these affective things. Yeah. Uh -huh. That is to say, you have to be situated affectively in the right way in order to know. Yeah. Our view is the view that we're articulating. I, I should call it our view because we're really still wrestling with this view. Sure. The view that we're talking about and sort of defending doesn't say that quite. It says that something like what is rational for you to judge is relative to your affective makeup. So yeah. that is to say that you could be sort of vicious in certain ways and still have rational belief. Whereas yeah. the virtue epistemologist wouldn't allow that. Right. Is the virtue, virtue epistemologist sorry, go ahead. No, well so is is would you guys characterized as grade one uh effective reasons that emotions position us evidentially, would you say that matches up more closely with virtue epistemology? Well it's weird because most virtue epistemologists wouldn't actually want to describe as evidential. Oh okay. So at least yeah. as far as I know, I mean, virtue epistemology is a really big thing, but basically virtue epistemologists think that, I mean, if you think about Zagzebski's way of putting it, she says that knowledge is belief arising out of acts of intellectual virtue or something like that. I don't remember the exact quote, but essentially she's saying only if you're virtuous, can you know? Yeah. Or anyway, yeah, sorry, that's too strong. Only if your belief is arising out of something like virtue, something that's either mimicking virtue or real virtue that you have, then you can know. Right? Yeah, I was I was scared there for a second, man. I'm yeah, I know. Virtue. Yeah, I mean, this is. I mean, <laughs> you know, I know? This one, they have to be really careful about this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you don't want to say that that vicious people can't know anything at all. That right, just seems right. obviously. Right. False. And, and as Calvinists, it's like, dude, then no one knows anything. We're, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's like, oh, no. Uh, yeah. So the, the virtue epistemologist is saying that your virtue is sort of what gives you rational judgment, because we're talking about rationality primarily. So right. if you think of knowledge as something like rational true belief, just as like a proxy, right? 
then if you want to sort of situate that within virtue epistemology, it'd be something like this. Uh, virtue is what allows you to believe rationally. Yep. Right. On, on the view as we're articulating it, it could be in your viciousness, your viciousness actually makes the rational requirements different than if you're yeah. virtuous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? So it that's does. that's why we don't want to think of it as, as a kind of virtue of this model. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's good. Well, okay, so how about then standpoint? Because maybe, you know, maybe oh, if you're yeah. a vicious person, then you're over here. And, and if you're uh, historically oppressed, then you're more virtue. Like sometimes yeah. the standpoint folks go in for that stuff, but yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm i not a, I, I don't think I would describe as a standpoint epistemologist, um, but I mean, standpoint epistemology, it's sort of like saying CRT or something at this point. It's like, nobody even knows what, I, that means so many different things Yeah, that it's really, really hard to say, this is what standpoint epistemologists think in the same way you can't say, this is what yeah. people who are CRTers think. Like, right, it depends just, on the location that you say it in. Oh my gosh, we just well, proved standpoint. Just, it depends on the, the theorist, right? I mean, yeah. there's some like, yeah. So it just very much depends on the theorist. So right. standpoint epistemology is a really big thing. But the kind of core principle of standpoint epistemology is something like this. Uh, your standpoints, that is the, the sort of situatedness of your epistemic life makes a difference to what you can know. Uh -huh. right? And you might think that sort of think about that in terms of rationality. It's sort of like um, you're more apt to have rational judgments if you are situated in certain standpoints or whatever. But the standpoint epistemology stuff, I'm not an expert in that. Um, I find some of it sort of intriguing, though, I'm, again, I'm not a standpoint epistemologist. But what's, what's interesting about standpoint epistemology for us is that it's a place where philosophers have been wrestling with the idea that affective stuff shapes rationality in this sort of deep fundamental way yeah and that's the kind of thing that we're trying to put our finger on and name very explicitly and so standpoint epistemology is something like in the space that we're concerned with now of course usually standpoint epistemologists want to say that the standpoints are a function of certain facts about either class, race, sex, gender, whatever, you know, sort of right. identity categories, you know, you want to discuss. And that those things have a profound influence on the sorts of things that you can know. Yeah. Right. Now, there's a way of understanding standpoint epistemology on which it's just sort of like it's the positional influence stuff. It's grade one. Your yeah. experiences shape what you'll attend to. And I mean, I think that's basically undeniable. Right. Right. Like, what, I mean, you know, there are people who, when they come to the Bible, say they'll notice things about stories that I wouldn't because we had different childhoods or we inhabit different spaces or whatever it is. Right. And some of that may track these identity markers. Right. Race, class, gender. I don't know. I, that's that wouldn't be surprising now that kind of if that's all you mean by standpoint epistemology that's pretty mild yeah I, that's like okay sure yeah like i'm i'm fine with that if by standpoint epistemology you mean something deeper right like something like well look it's these class race gender sex sort of categories that position you to be better at these things that's where a standpoint epistemology starts to get more controversial sure but notice that that view is also one on which, you know, um, there's a role for the affective domain that is deeper than this grade one positional stuff. Okay. Because the standpoints are kind of like, in, in a very, if you want to describe them very postmodernly, they're like lenses or filters or something like that. Right. 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 Um, now, we don't want to say that. And in part, we don't want to say that because we think it's false. <clears throat> excuse me, but in part, we think that our emotions aren't just sort of things that we feel for no reason. We think that yeah. emotions are more or less appropriate responses to the external world. Right. Yeah, man. Okay. That, that's a really important point that, that, that really helps me with your effective reason stuff that, that there's this appropriate or fittingness. Um, yeah. Like there's, so yeah. I just think of C.S. Lewis and I know you like Lewis cause you wrote about him in the book. 
Um, Lewis says something somewhere, maybe in a letter, like he doesn't enjoy the company of small children. And he's like, look, that's just who I am. And I know that that's wrong. I shouldn't be like that. And I've thought about that forever. I, I love small kids, but there's other people that I don't like and other things I don't like. And I'm like, hey, I can admit it because, look, I'm a human. I'm sinful. I'm fallen and I'm in process. And if I can, I'm going to position myself to change those things because I recognize in other people that these are really good traits. I would like to have that and think differently and be more like Christ. So I'm going to try and position myself to be better at that. But I can acknowledge that I'm jacked up and I don't feel OK. So uh, there's something else you got me excited about yeah. with like Harry Potter and wanting Voldemort to win. Like sometimes I want Voldemort to win, or I like oh, Gaston. No, Parker. I know, man. Or I like Darkseid and Thanos. Like I like these guys. And sometimes it's the, the author's fault for painting a more compelling picture of evil, maybe because we're sinners and we don't know Superman's so boring, you know, something like that. But so sometimes well, it's their fault. I, but sometimes Okay, it's so Parker, here's the thing. Here's the thing. So since we're off on this tangent, let's just yeah. let's just roll it. Yeah. I, I heard once, and I, I wish I could remember the name. I think it's this guy named Sean Coyne, I, who's okay. like a book editor. It doesn't matter. I mean, I just want to make sure that, you know, this isn't just I thought of this myself, right? Okay. I want to okay. attribute uh, yeah. where I need to attribute. He says that in every story, especially these kind of epic heroic tales, which some people think that's basically every good story. I sure. don't know about that, but whatever. Yeah. There's always the speech and praise of the villain. Mm -hmm. And the story does, and sometimes the villain is the one who gives the speech. Sometimes it's done on behalf of the villain, right? And it happens in different ways and different stories. But there always has to be the speech and praise of the villain. And the speech and praise of the villain has to be compelling. It has to, if it, otherwise the story doesn't work. Right. Like if you don't listen to Thanos and think, oh no, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe we do need to get rid of some of these. Like then the story won't, won't actually land. Right. Because the whole point of the story is to figure out the way like, I mean, this is why uh, Harry Potter is so interesting, right? Is because the idea of conquering death is actually a, the, the heart desire of every human being. Yeah. And so what, it, what Harry Potter is fundamentally about is two ways of conquering death, right? You have the Order of the Phoenix yeah. who says, I'm going to embrace my own death on behalf of others. And through that, I will be born again right? The, order, the, mm -hmm. the way of the phoenix, right? And yeah. then you have the death eaters, the people who are trying to use magical might, which is essentially in the story technology. I mean, it's just mm. technology, right? That's why the muggles look at the magicians like they're crazy. And the magicians are like, what is this electric light business, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. the death eaters, the death eaters are trying to swallow up death using technology, basically. Yeah. And so you have these two ways of dealing with our desire for immortality. That's and just transhumanism. Story, yeah. yeah. The story yeah. is compelling because both of those ways seem good to yeah. us. Right. Yeah. So if you don't have a little bit of yourself that's drawn to the Death Eaters, right, that understands and can appreciate, then the story wouldn't work. Yeah, right? that's good, man. But it's the same with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? It's it's yeah. a lot of these stories are this way. There always has to be, oh, for the greater good and it's normally by the way some kind of utilitarian yeah populace. yeah so so with me i maybe i'm a little bit more messed up than you but i, I really like the, the I, I really like the competence maybe because i felt incompetent as a kid and i really like the power because my I had big brothers just whomped on me all the time yeah. so it could be that like like moriarty i love moriarty and in, in yeah. uh, his, uh uh holmes's sherlock holmes's arch nemesis i i want to see him win, lose still like but I'm like, man, yeah. I want to hear more from that guy. Why doesn't he speak more? Usually the heroes are one dimensional and boring, but um, yeah, I mean, I that's true. That's why we like the origin stories more than the sort of second yeah. and third installment. Yeah. Totally. The origin stories, there's usually some kind of conflict, right? Yeah, that's um, right. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's, it is true that all of these stories, the, the villain has to have some grain of reality and truth that they've grasped Yeah. and a certain kind of skill. Otherwise they're very boring. Yeah. Like if you ever find yourself just completely bored in some story where it's a clear good versus evil thing, the reason why you're bored is probably because the villain is like, it, you don't, you're not compelled by the villain. Yeah. Man, right? that's good. The villain has to be compelling. Otherwise, you know, and the way to make them compelling is to have them be taking some truth and twisting it somehow. Yeah. Right? And this, I mean, you know, this is, yeah, this is the, this is the way. Right? That's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, going going back on, on effective reasons, um, is there a way for? I know this is not your your theory, and you're you're testing out as you've been thinking about it. Do you have you come across any way to change our 
effective reasons? Like, is it like a Pascalian wager or something? Or, uh, well, I mean, I not think, just for God, um, but for anything. Yeah. Therapy. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, honestly, I think that our our emotional life is a very complicated thing. Okay. Because. Okay, so do you want me to give away my what I my sort of like guess at you have what to is now. true? Yeah, okay. please. Yeah. So here's my guess at what is true. I think uh, my guess is that emotions in part encode complicated judgments. Okay. And they encode them so that we don't have to go through the process of reasoning when the stakes are high. Hmm. So, I mean, just think about it, right? Like the reason you have fear is so that you get away from dangerous things. Yeah, that's right? that's good. You don't want to be and doing- you don't want to have to be in a position where you're like, oh, well, let's see, this lion is charging at me. Yeah. I wonder if it's going to be okay in the end. It's got its teeth bared and stuff, but yeah. hmm, I don't know. Is yeah. this a dangerous case? So you want to, the fear kind of encodes the processes by which- You've made these judgments over time. So this is, by the way, a mistake that I think has happened in the conversation about, um, like if you read people like Danny Kahneman or Jonathan Haidt, yeah. all these folks who talk about our moral judgments and how we make them sort of split second prior to actually going through a process of reasoning. And then they're like, see, it's really just all, uh, yeah, it's rationalization. Yeah. It's all rationalization. Right. I think, no, that doesn't follow at all. That only follows if, there's no connection between our emotional stuff and our reason. But why think that? It might be that we have these emotional states to encode these patterns of reasoning that we would engage in reflectively in cases where we have enough time. Right? Yeah. When so, you're driving, when you're in the shower, we, I mean, we do this stuff, right? That's right. Yeah. So if that's right, then part of what we have to recognize is that the process of forming ourselves affectively yeah. is going to be time consuming and costly. Yeah. We're going to have to do a lot of cons like careful consideration. It requires honesty, right? So we have to say, here's how I actually feel. I'm going to take a step back, evaluate whether or not that feeling fits with what I'm actually experiencing in the world, mm -hmm. and then consider what it would look like to actually have felt more aptly in that case. Now, yeah. That that's so what I don't want people to hear me saying is something like, well, you have to control your emotions or something like I don't think that's that's not the right way to think about it in the same way. I don't think you can just control what you believe, but you can engage in practices that train. Right. Yeah. And you can engage in intentional practices of attending and you can engage in intentional practices of deciding to act on yeah. or not your feelings. Yeah. Right. And those are the kinds of things that over time can help shape, even if not utterly transform the way that we feel. Yeah. And I, I think that's actually a big part of what it looks like to grow cognitively in our love for God. Yeah. Right. So this I mean, this is some of the burden of like knowledge for the love of God is to help people understand why God gave us a mind. Right. Yeah. And part of the one of the things i don't talk about a lot is that the mind is in part able to kind of abstract in a way that our feelings don't okay and so if we want to shape our affective lives we need to do what good therapists teach you to do which is say here's what i'm feeling now let's sort of think about why i'm feeling that what's causing that and so on and that's part of what you're doing is you're processing those emotions not just like here's what it is but here's where it's coming from here's maybe why it's you know not fitting and so on and and then you sort of learn uh how to experience the world in a more healthy way yeah. right and something like the way you can train your cognitive life as well right you can get better at tasting wine noticing colors seeing you know, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. They say philosophy, but I, I'm not getting much better, I think, but uh, I'm working well, on it here. You're yeah. young yet, Parker. <laughs> us old guys who have been at this a long time, you know, it, no, it is. I mean, but it's the same thing. You, you get sharper, right? I remember yeah. when I started at Talbot as a student, I, I remember reading these books that JP would assign. Um, one of them in particular was this book called 
the identity of the self by this guy named Jeffrey Madeau. Hmm. And it was great, but I was reading it like six pages an hour, <laughs> you know? So I'd go in the library and I'd be reading and it just would take me forever. And now I can read a lot faster because I've gotten yeah. better at that sort of thing. I know, yeah. and I even am a better reader than I was. So it's the same with our emotional lives, but that required a lot of careful and intentional activity. Sometimes yeah. that was uncomfortable. You know? Yeah. I, I have a, I love journals. I have like a thousand journals and one of them I've been just doing reflections because I thought, you know, like uh, the, the part, the unexamined life is not worth living and know thyself, blah, blah, blah. So I started off and I was like, oh, am I doing psychology? And I've kind of inherited the beef with psychology and sociology because I'm studying philosophy. Like, oh, yuck, psychology. But then I was like, no, this is actually really cool. Like, why do I, I have a whole section on why do I like villains? in movies and it's kind of like what we talked about here yeah. so I'm, I'm starting to get to know myself in like the hopefully more philosophical uh way which maybe maybe like old school psychology like sukos you know or su suk soul in greek whatever yeah. um so suke. i'm excited about that suke yeah, yeah there we go um but i wonder when it, when it comes back to like the epistemology and effective reason is there a way to test uh your effective reasons so that you can know whether you're being rational or not you know what i mean like if these are affecting our rationality, how would I know? And how would I know about yours? Like, how do I know whether you're being rational based on your effective reasons? I don't know. Yeah. We need some <laughs> I, mind reading I, going on. I, I think like it's a, I think it's a really good question. Okay. I think it takes us back to the problem that we have where the, the, the reasonableness or the, the goodness of particular affective profiles, as we call them, um, that's whether that's going to be disruptive or helpful to our access to reality and so on. Um, those things are basic, you know, on this view, they wouldn't be a valuable independently of the, the self that is inhabiting that profile. Okay. And in that way, it's no different than people who think they're absolute standards of rational judgment that are independent of anyone and don't change for anyone ever. Right. I mean, if that's true, you can't tell what they are either. Right. So even if you are like an old school evidentialist who's committed to uniqueness and like thinks there's only one set of rational standards that has nothing to do with emotions at all, you still can't know whether or not those are the right ones independently of those very standards. So oh, because, yeah, okay, okay. because what we're talking about is something that it's at the foundational level of our rational lives. That's pretty good. And so you know, you can't really test those things independent of inhabiting them. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. And you can't like compare them to another set because we don't have those. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, so think of it this way. Um, I mean, I think that if you are sitting watching the sunset over the Pacific in Corona del Mar, California, you should be having certain emotional experiences that are connected to believing that this is beautiful and, and organized and really a sign of God's love and care. Yeah. But I can't convince you of that if you sit there and think this is hideous. Is there like a, do you have like a Ceteris Paribus clause, like barring, barring like bad negative experiences with like you getting jumped uh, at sunset at the same place? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what if I, what if I was yeah. jumped there and I'm like, I hate sunsets now. Oh yeah. I mean, look, okay. So a different location. I was um, camping up in the, uh, off the coast of Seattle um, at Fort EB, hmm. which is on one of the little islands out there. And I have like this fear of falling and my daughter is oh, oh, fantastic. There she is. Oh wait, wrong shoulder. Right there. <laughs> That's when she was much younger. Uh, yeah. Anyway, she, she was at the edge of this bluff and there's like no fence or anything. And she, she uh, is a bit of a klutz in the sense that she's not like super stable, right. Okay. On her feet. And so she was like walking on this, this bluff. And I know, I know that it's safe and the sun is setting right over the Puget Sound. Like, and it is spectacularly beautiful. Right. Uh -huh. But my daughter's out there walking across this bluff and I can't think of anything, but like, she's going to fall. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's all I can focus on. I'm I'm not considering anything else, and that's in part because I'm having these like emotional experiences, and you know there there are things that emotions do to our cognitive lives. Like negative emotions tend to hyper focus us on things. Okay. Positive emotions tend to sort of make us think big picture. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm like. I noticed the sunset, but I wasn't even forming judgments about that, much less forming the right judgments about it. I was mostly just feeling afraid yeah. and trying to prevent myself from like helicopter parenting my <laughs> daughter, who was perfectly safe. Right. That I could scarring her for life. It. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, it's just, it's not good. Right. So you have to, right. you know, this is like a, a challenge of parenting, right? You have to let them do their thing. And so, I, you know, I, I think it's right to say that. Yeah, there's a kind of ceteris paribus clause where, you know, you have to be, you know, yeah, if you just got jumped, like, and you haven't considered the beauty of the sunset and it's being a sign of God's love and care. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, you irrational fool. Like, that, that's, that's just not... That's okay. not, that's just being a bad person. You know, that's, that's, right. yeah. that's not really about epistemology. Anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, just, good. that's just being annoying. Uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I think you're right. You have to be careful in these, in these cases. But like, if you're, if you're thinking about two people who are considering the same thing, I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about this in terms of like a waterfall, like somebody's like, Oh, that's yeah. nice. Sublime. It's like, no, that's not quite good enough. You know, yeah. like you should be experiencing something more deep yeah. than that. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. dude, I, I took you so far without talking about this book. Let me, let me, um, I like the book. It's, it's good. I'm so glad we, we were able to talk about that stuff as well. Um, once again, the book is knowledge for the love of God, why your heart needs your mind. And so we set this up super well to just skim through really quickly. But uh, there's, you, you deal with this question in, in chapter five, is faith compatible with knowledge? And mm -hmm. Um, I studied apologetics too, and, and, uh, I still am, and I'm still studying philosophy and stuff. And I'm at this point where I'm like, golly, man, like why I'm losing touch with the uh, initial uh, impetus for it. Can you help motivate like this question? Why, why, um, why would someone think that? Like, why would someone think the faith is not compatible with knowledge? I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to give new atheists much of anything <laughs> um and i think their their sort of hold on culture has waned really sure. dramatically but on this i think they articulated aptly a, a sort of cultural reality yeah which is that we think of faith fundamentally as persistent belief in the face of evidence to the contrary right so, um, and I don't think that's, that's not, I, that's not even really an insight that the new atheist brought to bear. I mean, this is like, this has got legs from old, right? I mean, this has been a thing at least since the 17th century, if not earlier. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. So, so essentially a lot of us, when we think of faith, we think of continuing to believe something because we want to or something because yeah. we're hoping that it's true. And so in that way, there's a kind of conflict between what we have faith is true and what really is true. Yeah. Because faith then would be like, well, irrational. Yeah. I mean, any, any belief that's connected up to some act of faith is going to be irrational because it's, it's going to be flying in the face of the evidence. Yeah. And so I have, I mean, as I mentioned in the book, I teach this stuff to lots and lots of students. So I teach this big class called Foundations of Christian Thought. Hmm. It's one of the first classes that students take here at Biola. Everybody's required to take it. Nice. And I do, I teach like 400 students a year, this stuff. Dang. And, and, um, and so many of them come into the class thinking that really at the end of the day, faith and knowledge like if you think you can know the content of the christian faith you're actually like disrupting its being faith right and that's the instinct that i'm wanting to unravel basically because i think yeah. it doesn't it's not biblical well i hear that i guess i mean i i work with college students too and sometimes i'll hear that and i try to be i think i, I always try to be nice about it but i, I do hear them try to use 
faith in that way as an apologetic and like well duh that's why it's called faith and you're like wait what no that's yeah. not a great that's not a great defense there yeah 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 i mean that's not that's just not what the i mean i, I actually so i just did a chapel this morning for this the convocation chapel for talbot hmm. school of theology nice. here and the passage that i started with uh we're, we're doing a, a series on sola fide so faith alone and the passage was Hebrews 11. That's the one I chose. And I love yeah. Hebrews 11 because it says things like, by faith, we understand. Yeah. Right? And understanding is an achievement beyond even knowledge. Right. Like understanding is knowledge uh, sort of systematized and applied. Totally. And so it says, by faith, we understand that God made the world in the beginning so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Yeah. Uh, you know, by faith... Moses left Egypt, right? So you have all these things of, of people understanding the world. Yeah, not just believing. Not by faith you believe and you can have a vague That's notion right. of, yeah. It's understanding. And right. and in the scriptures, the contrast with faith is sight, not knowledge or evidence or reason. Yeah. So it's true that if you have faith in something, you haven't seen it. Like that's that's just true. Okay. Um, and that's what the scriptures say. So this is yeah. why in, in the letter to one, the first letter to the Corinthians that we have, what we call first Corinthians, Paul talks about faith, hope, and love being these three things that are great, mm -hmm. but the greatest is love. Why is the greatest love? Because Won't pass faith passes away Yeah. because mm -hmm. right now we see through a mirror darkly, right? So, I mean, he's, he's not talking about a dirty piece of glass or he's talking about a looking glass. It's yeah. a mirror. We see through this like bad mirror darkly and we have faith in the realities that were that God has promised. Right. Including our own salvation. Yeah. Now, that faith disappears when we see face to face. So, so Paul's like, now we see through a glass darkly, then we shall see face to faith. These three remain faith, hope and love. Hope is about those future realities, confidence that they're going to come. Faith is trusting God to deliver them. Yeah. Right. And love is just love and faith <laughs> and hope disappear because in the end you see face to face, you no longer need faith or hope. The, the promised future reality is present. So no more hope. Faith is no longer needed because you see face to face, but you still have love. Right. Yeah. So faith is not believing in the face of contrary evidence or something. Faith is trust in God to do what he's promised. Yeah. And that's religious faith, right? That's faith in God. There are other forms yeah. of faith that are similar, right? Like, you know, you have faith in a chair to hold you up. And yeah. uh, when you sit down, you no longer need faith because you're experiencing it face to face, as it were. Holy yeah. Up. Then you, your faith changes that will continue holding you up. Or, yeah, or, that's right. So but yeah. notice that you never get to see it, right? So yeah. it, the, the minute you've seen the object of faith is the minute you no longer have faith. So yeah. notice that you no longer have faith that the chair was going to hold you up. That faith goes away. You now have faith that the chair is going to continue to hold you up right. because that's a future reality, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and it's always, that's how faith works, but it's not just the future. It's also the past. That's why the author of Hebrews says, by faith, we know, we, ha we understand that the universe was made by the hand of God. Yeah, because we don't right? see it. We didn't it. see that either, right? And in fact, yeah. bizarrely, science can't see that, right? So if you're right. before playing time, nobody knows what's going on. You think we'll still, I mean, we'll still probably have to have faith in that though, in the new heavens and new earth unless God's like, Yes. Surprise, block universe, and I'm going to show I, you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen there, but that's not what Paul is concerned with. Right, right. In that moment. <laughs> like, Paul is concerned with faith in God to sort of follow through on his promises, yeah. not faith about the past. So, yeah, I mean, in that sense, there'll still be faith in heaven. There won't be the faith in God to deliver us that we currently require. Yeah. Man, that's good. Um, yeah, I like you, 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 you mentioned, I mean, you use a lot of scripture in here, which is awesome as well. You, uh, you make this point that, uh, faith and knowledge are so compatible in scripture that scripture often, uh, just portrays them together without any kind of conflict. Yeah. And I don't just, it's just personally edifying for me, man, to, to see that and to see like, oh, it's in here and here's the scripture that he's using and here he's backing it up. So it's really, uh, encouraged by that. So thank, thanks yeah. for doing that. I, yeah, I mean, Parker, I, that's why it's so striking to me that the students that I encounter, bless them. I mean, like, I love my students. They're friends sure. and they're great, right? They're so good. But so, so many of them really struggle to see this. But if you, once you notice it, it's 
everywhere. I mean, yeah. there's this passage in Second Peter where it's, you know, it's like this catalog of virtues that you find, you know, anyway. And Peter's like, add to your faith a bunch of stuff and then eventually add to all that stuff love, right? So it's like founded by faith and love. And like the second thing he says is add to that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and he doesn't say, oh, by the way, that's gonna make you not have faith anymore. Like huh. he's saying, you have faith. Now add knowledge to your faith. And that's like the constant theme of the scriptures. I mean, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is this great moment in Mark's gospel where this dad comes and he's got this kid who's been possessed since he was born. And like, it's like he's throwing himself and trying to drown him and like in the fires. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. Like you can, if you put yourself in the mindset of this dad, it's just like horrifying. And he comes to Jesus and he's like, Hey Jesus, if you can heal my son, would you please heal me or heal him? And, and Jesus is like, if <laughs> you know, he's like, if, like, yeah. if I can do it. Uh, and the dad's like, then there's this moment. And this is the mantra of like so many people's lives and my own. Like yeah. the dad says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Right? Yeah. Now, what's going on here, I think, is that Jesus is just profoundly insightful about the human condition. Mm -hmm. And so when the dad approaches, he already knows that this dad is double-minded yeah. with respect to who Jesus is. Jesus sees that. and he, But he's coming nonetheless, right? It's an expression of trust, but he's also disbelieving, right? He says, I'm, I'm an unbeliever also. Now, Jesus, though, knows that what the dad needs is not really the healing of his son, though he does want that very deeply. And that's really important to the dad. Jesus yeah. wants to get that. To he also, Jesus knows that he wants to heal the son, but he doesn't want to do it until the dad is situated for what he really needs, which yeah. is knowledge that Jesus is able to heal. Yeah. And so he confronts the father with himself. That, that is, he confronts the father with the father's self. So he says, if, to this guy who says, if you can heal my son, would you heal him? And then all of a sudden the father realizes about himself that I'm both a believer and a disbeliever. Hmm. And he's now living in the real world. He's seeing himself clearly in a way that he had not seen himself before. And then what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't say, just have faith, dude. <laughs> what does he do? He educates the guy. And yeah. in this case, the education involves healing his son. So the goodness for the son is bound up with what's good for the father yeah. in two ways. One is it's good for his son. Like he's just, he's bound up with his son. And so his son being healed is healing him in a certain way. But also it's healing his cognitive dissonance by bringing him into an educated space. Jesus gives him evidence that he can heal the son by doing it, right? Yeah. So he's not just saying, oh, just trust me. Don't worry. It'll all be okay in the end. Jesus says, no, notice the reality of your heart. And now let me educate that heart. Yeah. I think that's a really beautiful picture of Jesus caring both for the son, for the father's relation to the son, but also for that father's own cognitive life with respect to Jesus. And he doesn't just like hunt and say, just have faith. He says, let me help you see this reality. Right? And he doesn't just heal, heal the kid right away and not address the double mindedness exactly of the father. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause he does care yeah. about him. Yeah, man, that's good. I like that. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> it's so good. So uh, I just, there's this question that was like, uh, I think it was like eating at you. Uh, why does knowledge matter once you're a member of God's family? Yeah. Um, can you can you help explain like what the existential import of this? Yeah. So I think for for those of us like me, and I, it sounds like like you too, Parker, who get into the life of the mind through apologetics, mm -hmm. we tend to think that the pursuit of greater understanding is fundamentally about people outside the church. Now, yeah. it is about that, but I don't think it's only about that. Mm -hmm. And in my own experience, that ran out of, like I ran out of steam drawing only on that fuel. Yeah. And what 
I never really understood though. Actually, if you go back and you read carefully some of the, the sort of pioneers of this stuff in the contemporary age, like people like JP and Bill yeah. who talk about the role of the mind, they talk about the apologetic stuff, but they also talk about the role of this stuff in the believer's formation. I mean, if, if you look at love your God with all your mind, this was a surprise to me. I, I totally forgot about this, but it, like half the book is about spiritual formation. Yeah. It's like, good. I mean, it's just, it's just like, here are the structure of the soul and its parts and stuff. It's like, really? I mean, I didn't, I wasn't ready for that stuff when I first yeah. read that book, you know, yeah. it's classic JP. It's so good. That's right. But anyway, you know, so it's just like, I didn't see that stuff. I didn't have eyes to see it for whatever reason. Right. And Val, yeah, it was your, uh, it was your, your reasons. Yeah. It was your, your, your uh, virtue epistemology. You weren't in the right position to see that yet. Standpoint yeah. was all off. I, maybe that's, yeah. I don't know exactly how to describe <laughs> just it. Just messing with you, having some callbacks <laughs> here, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, nonetheless, I didn't see what role the life of the mind was supposed to play since I'm already devoted to Jesus. Yeah. And I think the reason I didn't understand that was because I didn't see that knowledge and deeper understanding was connected in profound ways to fundamental movements of formation. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do in the book is try to help people see how knowledge is related to presence with God. Yeah. And, you know, um, that, that was transformational for me because it helped me to think about my life as an academic and even just the nerdy rabbit trails that I follow about all sorts of things, whatever it is, as ways of pursuing God in different spaces, right? Yeah. And so a big part of the book is wanting to sort of help connect those dots in a way that I hope will be compelling for folks. Um, I know it's been a help to some of my students, not all of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> we always miss a couple, but yeah. it's... It's, I think it's been transformative for, for me and it's been transformative for people around me. And it's nothing that people haven't been saying. It's just another way of saying it that I hope will add to the chorus and contribute to that movement. Yeah. There's, there's been a lot of uh, really good books in a similar vein put out recently, which I'm, I'm excited about. Uh, and some of them are already come on. Some are coming on later. Uh, and I like this one because the knowledge aspect and I, because I was surprised because of the metaphysics, uh, the Atlas of reality thing, and that was kind of cool. And you're, I, I felt like you're you're uh, playing in someone else's sandbox, but here you are, you know, backing it all up, which is awesome. So I, I was I was a big takeaway for me uh, was man, God really cares about knowledge, like He really genuinely does. Like the whole Bible is about like us knowing God, and then you also broaden it out. It's not just propositional knowledge, it's not just knowing facts. There's also acquaintance level knowing God, but but then, man, there's the two poles uh, and the swing, the pendulum, uh, whatever analogy we use, uh, where people go, you know, I, it's a part of personal relationship. And it's like, OK, well, who, who is God? Like, well, explain the Trinity. You're like, you, you can't fully, but people will be like, no, I just I know God. I don't need to know about God. And other people are like, no, I just need to know about God. And anyone who's, yeah. you know, squishy about having a loving relationship, you're wrong. But it's like it's both. And, and the Bible says it. And you, yeah. you elaborate on, on that a little bit here, which is really nice. I mean, look, Parker, if you were to apply that to any romantic relationship, yeah, you would get broken up with. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you, you know, look, I've been married for 19 years. Wow. And if someone were to start asking me a question about my wife and they were like, well, what color is her hair? And I'm like, I don't know. What color are her eyes? No idea. What does she long for, hope for, fear, desire? You know, like, what does she think about things? And I was like, I don't know any of that. Look, I just love her. Yeah. You know, I just know her. People be like, Dude, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Like that's just that's totally bonkers that you yeah. would think that you could know her interpersonally without knowing things about her. And in fact, coming to under I mean, this is why when you go on dates and you really want to get to know somebody, you ask them questions and they're sort of layers, right? You you yeah. you understand, all of us do internally, what it looks like to reveal yourself in deeper and deeper ways to another person. Yeah. Well, that requires communicating facts about yourself. Now you communicate those facts as a way to build that kind of interpersonal connection, yeah. but you can't build the interpersonal connection without that communication, right? Yeah. It just doesn't, 
It doesn't work. And so why would we think that it would be any different with God? We must, we have to reveal ourselves to him, right? Because self-disclosure is part of building connection. But yeah. we also have to allow him to reveal himself to us. Those are two sides of the coin of building interpersonal connections. Now, you can't reduce the interpersonal connection to just that. That's yeah. right. But you can't do it without it either. So this right. is why a mantra of the book is more, not less. Right. The yeah. mistake that we often make is thinking that because that's not all there is to a thing, you don't need that thing. Well, right. that's just to confuse necessary and sufficient conditions to use like philosophical Boom. terminology. Yeah, that's right. You, so the point is propositional knowledge is a necessary condition for interpersonal connection with God. It's not sufficient, yeah. however. Yeah. So, but we have to situate our knowing as oriented toward that interpersonal connection with God. Otherwise, we make the mistakes that the scriptures talk about, knowledge popping up and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So yeah. we need to subject our pursuit of God cognitively to our pursuit of him relationally. Yeah. But we can't pursue him relationally without pursuing him cognitively. Like, that doesn't totally. make any sense. Totally. Man, I'm, I'm with you. And I, I've also been encouraged in my in my own apologetics. I've, I've accidentally got into some um, apologetic encounters lately on podcasts, which I didn't know was going to happen. But just being honest with people and saying like, look, uh, here's some reasons why I believe in God. Um, and, you know, I am a Calvinist, so I do think that the Holy Spirit has cause, but I do have reasons as well. But also like, I think I know God interpersonally the way I know my mom in, in an analogous way, maybe. So like, I don't think that like, you're going to disprove that my mom exists, though maybe if I'm a, fal a fallibilist, Maybe that's possible, right? But like, it's a similar thing. And I just being honest with people, like, I know this sounds kind of crazy to you. And in apologetics, we want to be as objective as po as possible. But like, genuinely, I think I know God. And mm -hmm. it's just, you're not going to convince me that I don't know him in, from one encounter like this, you know? So I, I was encouraged by the book in, in that as well, that like, no, I, I, I can yeah. embrace that and just live with that. Like, that's true and it's good. And I... I sing about that on Sunday, so I'm going to embrace it in my uh, philosophy and, and apologetics and theology as well. So thanks yeah, for the book, man. Healthy. Oh, oh, my pleasure. You know, it's yeah. fun to write. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, dude. So, I mean, I, I kept you here a long time. We went all over the place, covered a lot of stuff. You, you got to come back on. Please come on sometime. We'll talk more stuff. You got a lot of stuff that we could talk about, which would be great. I, I'd love to. It's been a pleasure to be here with you, Parker. Awesome. Well, one more time for the audience. It's Knowledge for the Love of God While Your Heart Needs Your Mind. And it's Timothy Pickavance. Uh, grab that book. Check it out. Check out uh, Check out more of Tim's work. Where, where, where can they find it, Tim? You got a website? Yeah. So uh, weirdly, an anagram of Tim Pickavance is Pancake Victim. And no one can spell Pickavance. And so my website is pancakevictim.com. I tweet at Pancake Victim, though that's kind of a new thing. So yeah, you just look for Pancake Victim-y things and you'll, you'll find me. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love it. Well, uh, that's going to have to do it, folks. Uh, you definitely get your money's worth uh, on this episode. If you want to support the podcast, links in the description, uh, support us on Patreon, all that good stuff, and leave us a comment uh, what you think of this episode. All right. As always, all glory to God.